chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This takes place right after John had run to the tomb and found it empty. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things have taken place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body there and came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if we're going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road, and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts in all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Understandably, right after the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciples were devastated. They just lived through the horror of seeing Jesus crucified. And now there was the very real possibility that crucifixion could be in their own futures. They really didn't know. Their futures were a bit uncertain. They were displaced. They were wondering where to go and what to do. And in our gospel reading for today, two of them had set out on about a days-long trip to leave Jerusalem and go to a town called Emmaus, a small village uh, a little bit away. Why did they go there? We don't really know. We're not told. It might be because Emmaus was a small, out-of-the-way town, and they would be safer from arrest there, and they could maybe start to rebuild their life or what was left of their life. And as they began to process what had happened, They started to talk with each other about all the details. They started to run things over again in their heads to to relive it once more with each other. And as they were walking and talking about the one and only thing they could think of, another man on the road to Emmaus joined them. He seemed to be drawn in by their conversation, which is understandable. That conversation likely was intense. It would have been hard to ignore. And this man was a little bit strange in that he didn't really know what they were talking about. So they filled him in on all the details, and they continued to lament the whole situation, saying, you know, we had thought, we were so sure that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. I mean, we thought we knew. We were so sure about it. Most of us here at one point in our life have lived through grief. And for those of us who have lived through grief, you may recognize in our gospel reading for today, some of the stages of grief identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book on death and dying. Uh, The stages of grief, in case you're unfamiliar with them, are denial. Second on the list is anger. Then move on to bargaining. 
on to depression, and finally to acceptance. Now, the disciples, as we find them today, are not too far into the grieving process. It had only been a couple of days. So they were at the beginning of a heart-wrenching kind of grief. They went over how things could have been different, going through all the if-onlys, hurting for the loss of their friend and mentor, and wondering what in the world was going to happen to them next. Jesus had died. They were afraid. But what they didn't know as they walked along the road that day is that Jesus had risen, that the resurrection had changed everything. And from this point on, their community, this group of Jesus followers, was a community that was going to be living in exile. I talked a bit about this last week. I told you how the Celtic Christian community formed. Missionaries were sent out to the church to an area that is now known as Ireland and Scotland. And when the missionaries arrived there, they found a well-structured clan structure uh, in place. And it was very difficult for outsiders to enter into these various clans. They weren't really allowed to. So they formed their own communities, communities in which Christians were exiled from the culture around them. And they developed their own response to the experiences of being pushed away. And that resulted, as I said last week, a tradition that is rich in music, prayers, and devotions that all reflected this struggle to live in community. I'd like to tell you just about one of the missionaries from this area. His name is Aidan. He's now a, a saint in the Catholic Church. He's most remembered for his work in the seventh century uh, when he was consulted to mediate a clan conflict, even though he was living as a member of an exiled Christian community. The official remembrance of his life maintained by the church says this. His life was lived in marked contrast to the apathy of the times. His life was lived in marked contrast. Lived in marked contrast. I, I kind of like that. that. That's what exile was for them and for the very early church. In fact, exile meant the same thing for the Christians in Ireland and Scotland as it did for the very first disciples. They all believed the message of Jesus' resurrection. So their community stood in marked contrast to the society around them. It meant that they were marching to the beat of their own drummer. They had different scripts than the scripts of the empire around them, different guidelines that, that formed how they lived their lives. And they now had the task of trying to identify those scripts and to faithfully live into them. You know, several, uh, several years ago, probably about five or six years ago now, I learned a somewhat disturbing fact, and that is that the Pacific sockeye salmon is currently a big topic in environmental advocacy groups. Apparently, in some areas of the world, the salmon population is at a somewhat critical point. Many, issues are fa many species are facing extinction, which was troubling for me to discover for several reasons. Uh, one, I care about environmental issues and all the things that live on our planet. But the other reason that this is troubling for me is a somewhat selfish reason. Salmon is one of the very few fish that I actually like to eat. But either way, I learned that this particular species of salmon is experiencing trouble due to uh, issues in the rivers in which they spawn. Now, salmon, as you may or may not know, uh, spawn in freshwater streams, and then they migrate to the ocean where they live. But every year, they return to the streams, they migrate back to the streams that their own eggs were born in to spawn again. And while well, that's fascinating all on its own, what's even more fascinating is the distance that some of these fish swim. Some are expected to swim over a thousand miles, and a good chunk of that is swimming against the tide, against the current, going upstream. But these salmon are so strong that they can swim against the stream. They can use their bodies to literally jump over rocks and, and small waterfalls. And why am I sharing this all of you with all of you? Did, did the Christians know about the salmon? I doubt it. It's just my long way of saying that the symbol of the very early church was the symbol of a fish. And it, and it was right to be a fish. Uh, by establishing themselves as followers of Jesus, a man who proclaimed an unusual message of love and peace and justice, the early church had set themselves against the messages of the culture in which they lived. And as a result, they found themselves swimming very hard against the current. The disciples on the road to Emmaus had started their swim upstream, going against their culture. 
The Christians in Ireland and Scotland also had to swim in that direction. So what about, what about you and me? Now, last week, I gave you some of these scripts that our empire gives to us. This week, I'd like to give you some the alternative scripts that Jesus offers to us so that we can figure out how to live in the light of Easter. And the truth of the resurrection might uh, place us in contrast, uh, finding ourselves swimming upstream against the, uh, against the current of our, our culture. The first script that I want to share is the script of mystery. Now, we live in a society where we try to have an answer for every question. Yet Jesus seems to be continually inviting us to live with mystery, to live with a certain amount of doubt. And truth be told, we have to live with that because we as humans don't have the answer to every single question. I mean, we, we cannot describe or create a formula that describes God. And we may want a different reality than what we find around us, but that different reality that we call the kingdom of God isn't a reality that can be ushered in by logic or by reason. In order to usher in the kingdom of God, uh, we're sometimes unable to see the big picture. But we continue to do this because our lives have been transformed by God and we, can be, and we believe in God's continued involvement in our world, God's continued work in our world. But our, our culture, our empire, still tells us that questions must have answers. The way of Jesus invites us to a life of mystery where we strive not for answers all the time, but rather for a faith that carries us through when we simply don't know the answers. The second script that I think that we're called to live is the script of suffering. Now, I know that we're three weeks out from the passion and death of Jesus, and we come back to the topic of suffering. But we can't avoid the fact that sometimes standing up for what you believe to be true and to be right can result in, in some pain. The old saying is true, it's not always easy to do what is right. Jesus was killed because of what he said and how he lived. And if we claim to be followers of Jesus, trying to live like he lived, it shouldn't come as a big surprise that we may experience some difficulty. The scripts of Jesus are not the scripts of the empire. And any idea that is in opposition to the mainstream is going to be met with some resistance. But the message of our faith is a, is a way to find comfort in fact, following Jesus usually means that we may experience some suffering in our lives instead of the comfort and material success that uh, our empire sometimes says that we should have. The, th the third script is the script of reconciliation. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be at peace with other people. And that can sometimes sound strange because it, it puts us at odds with the messages of the world, messages that tells us that we can just plow right on through anyone who stands in our way that we can disregard the opinions of others who don't agree with us and, uh, and promote our own ideas as the only valid ones. But the script of Jesus is one that invites tax collectors and prostitutes to our dinner table. It's one that offers forgiveness to those that are on death row. It's about making time in our schedules for, for children, even those that are not our own. I mean, the scripts of Jesus invite us to live lives of reconciliation rather than lives where we disregard other people just so that we can get ahead. And the final script that I want to share is the script of transformation. Last week I said that one of the scripts of the empire that they give to us is that we can do anything that we want all on our own if we simply try hard enough. But the script of Jesus reminds that we are a people in need of a savior. The script of Jesus is a script where we enter into a loving relationship with the living God because we believe that God has the power to transform our lives, that God can heal us in a way that no book, no class, or exercise can come close to doing. In short, the script of the world doesn't have the power to change us, but the script of Jesus has more than just the power to change us, it can transform us. So those are the, the scripts, mystery, suffering, reconciliation, and transformation. And if we live our lives by these scripts, if we go with them as the guiding principles in our lives, and take them into the world as we head from the, the empty tomb and into the new and life-giving light of Jesus, we will have become just like the disciples on the way to Emmaus, a community going against the popular culture, a community in exile. Now, we all know that exile is not really a new idea, especially in our faith. The Jews were exiled at different points in their lives as a nation. 
And there are certain things that can happen to a community when they're exiled. One that we heard about in our scripture reading for this morning is this sense of sadness, of displacement, of knowing that the place that we find ourselves in isn't familiar. It's, it's no longer home. The place we find ourselves in is a place that might be hostile to the things that we believe, that runs opposed to the convictions that we live. And along with those feelings are the additional feelings of uncertainty, of insecurity, and of pain, with the realization that things are not as they once were and they never will be the same again. Exile is, is difficult because in the experience of exile, you're no longer carried along by the popular culture. You're challenged to swim against the current, to live lives following the scripts of the exile rather than the scripts of the empire. But as difficult as exile is, it, in it, we can find a gift. I mean, God always finds a way to work in difficult situations. And what we find in our tradition is that in the pain and the uncertainty, we find the gift of hope. We find hope in the new scripts that Jesus offers to us because new scripts mean new possibilities the kingdom of God coming to life right before our eyes. Walter Brueggemann shares this idea. He's a brilliant Old Testament scholar, and he writes this about the, the Jewish exile in Babylon. I quote here, Israel's seemingly helpless present is teeming with liberation and intentionality. Israel is expected to cease its mesmerized commitment to the rulers of the age who thrive on the despair of Israel and to receive the freedom of imagination to act as a people who are headed home. What the disciples didn't know that day as they started out on the road to Emmaus, and what we may not know of, of knowing as we left the empty tomb several weeks ago, was that they had set out on an experience of exile. And we may not be completely in exile, but we are on an adventure of learning to live the different scripts of Jesus rather than the ones that society hands to us. And as we walk along like those first disciples, we may not fully understand the difficult task that we've taken on, the task of living with the mystery and the suffering and the reconciliation and the transformation of the resurrected Christ. We at times may feel displaced. We may feel uneasy because we might even feel terrified as we walk along. And the people who walk along with us on this journey might even share those fears with us. They walk alongside us in the depths of grief, struggling with denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and moving slowly toward acceptance. And we move slowly because we're swimming against a very strong current. What, the, what those first disciples may have known that day as they walked along in their grief and in their confusion was the discovery that their faith was calling them to do some things that was going to be really hard to do. But even so, they weren't alone. They weren't abandoned. They weren't fighting this current only on their own power. It took them a while to realize that. Finally, they realized that the resurrected Christ never had left them alone, that Christ had been there the entire time. Now, if we decide to live out our faith and accept the scripts of Jesus, there are going to be times when we have to do some serious upstream swimming. We're going to face situations and with the convictions of our faith place us in opposing positions to the messages of our culture. And I'll admit that's not an easy place to be at. It's uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty there and a lot of fear. But we set out on the journey because the message of Jesus was so compelling. That the very least that we could do was give our whole lives to following him, even if it means laying down the old way of life and embracing something that is totally new. Even if it means following Jesus to strange places, places like a cross, Places like a tomb. Even if it means taking on new scripts, new ways of living that run against the current of the messages that we hear every day in our world. Like the Jews in Babylon, like the disciples after the resurrection, like the early Christians in Ireland and Scotland, we are people who are invited to live the scripts of mystery, suffering, reconciliation, and transformation. And on our way, we may feel from time to time that we are all on our own. We may feel ourselves wishing for things to return to the easy and accepted way. But if we keep it up, if we process our pain and our doubt and our fear and keep living the scripts of Jesus, 
Well, notice that there are others on the road with us. There are others on the journey with us, sharing in our struggles. And if we continue to keep walking together, following faithfully, we'll begin to recognize that Jesus, this Savior that we long to see, will discover that he's been walking right alongside us the entire time. And he will continue to do so until the end of time. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Amen.